All right, everyone, before I get started on today's um, first four slides of the Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Lecture, I just want to kind of preface um, this a couple different ways. Um, number one, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the College Board has narrowed um, our course down to Unit 1, Unit 2, and Unit 3. I wrote this in the introduction uh, to the kind of our plan of action that I posted in Google Classroom, but essentially that's the history and the pathway to the Constitution and federalism. It's all of institutions, so Congress, the presidency, federal courts, and the bureaucracy, and then it's civil rights and civil liberties. And so all the other stuff we did this year, while important for you to understand as a citizen, is, is not critical to the exam, but this is. So I want to acknowledge that this is obviously less than ideal. I feel really unnatural doing it this way. And, you know, my tendency to perform and, and parade myself around the class, throwing my arms up in the air exuberantly, um, really is, is rather stifled in this format. But it's, it's what we have. Um, so we're going to work with it. My recommendation to you is to um, be listening to this lecture while you're taking notes in a notebook. And then when you hit something that you don't understand or, or want more experience with, rather than being able to ask a question in real time to me, you're just going to have to open up Wikipedia or use Google. Thankfully, we live in 2020. If this had happened in 1987, we'd be in a, a whole world of pain. But we have a lot of technology at our disposal, <clears throat> and I, I'd very much encourage you to use it. And for whatever it's worth, this is exactly the format my wife gets her lectures um, from nursing school. So it's not unheard of. That said, here we go. So the first slide that we're going to look at here and the first question we're going to explore is, is pretty simple. What are civil liberties? Um, this unit is civil liberties and civil rights. On the next slide, I will go into what is the difference between the two of those. But essentially, what we can say is that civil liberties are basically the protections in our Constitution, written into our Constitution, um, that protect us from our government, right? These are not protections against other individuals, protections you know, from criminals. These are protections from our very own government. And as you can kind of imagine, as you're sort of closing your eyes and envisioning the Constitution, a document we've worked with a fair bit this year, where do you see them? You see them really explicitly written in the first 10 articles uh, of the uh, first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights. If you remember, the Bill of Rights came about as a result of anti-federalist arguments from, from kind of anti-federalist heavy states saying we needed additional protections from the government built in. And so the Bill of Rights provides them um, and the Bill of Rights creation was, was a requirement. If you remember that review, that history there, it was a requirement for some states to even consider ratifying the Constitution. So the civil liberties were put in place to get anti-federalists on board. Um, you can think about the history and the context of why people would be feeling, why do we need constitutional protections from our very own government? That seems silly, except that, right, it doesn't. And, and to those people at the time, the anti-federalists especially, you know, King George and, and the, the British abuses um, were fresh on the minds. The ability to just take away um, rights and powers and privileges and freedoms just arbitrarily without any due process. And so we're going to look at the specific like chunks of civil liberties further in this, in this presentation, but I, I want to kind of preface the whole thing here, which is civil liberties are, are one of those things that we all sort of agree with in theory. Everybody says, yes, we should have freedom of speech. We should have freedom of expression, we should have right to assembly. But then we sometimes find that our belief, while very overwhelming when asked just simply, becomes a whole lot more nuanced when I start to ask you, what about the Ku Klux Klan? What about the Westboro Baptist Church who picket funerals for soldiers, you know, saying God hates, 
you know, fags or, or, or that God hates America or, or the Ku Klux Klan who's advocating for like lynching and incredibly racist policies. Do they deserve freedom of speech? And I think the, the question that we have to really push ourselves on is that we can't really have it both ways. If we believe people have the right to speech, then they have the right to speech, even if what they say is obscene and grotesque. And, and Congress has tried to limit what we mean by grotesque speech. And there has been some clarification by the courts on, you know, you know, there is a limit, right? Like you, the child pornography is not protected speech. But in general, it, it gets really messy when you push people to take their theoretical support and apply it to really controversial areas, places where we can all agree that people like the Westboro Baptist Church are just horrible human beings, but they still have freedom of speech. And so then the other question is, is the tension exists is, do we give away our civil liberties, our protections from our own government in exchange for security? And, you know, this phrase on the right of the, the slide comes to mind here. Um, and, and I actually think it's not even attributable to Benjamin Franklin, but it's popularly attributable to him, which is the idea that those who would give up essential liberty to purchase temporary security or safety deserve neither. Uh, and it's a very catchy phrase. So uh, I just want to quickly, quickly clarify the difference between civil liberties and civil rights. I already said that civil liberties are those freedoms and protections guaranteed by the Constitution that guard us against tyranny from our own government. Government can't limit our speech. Government can't tell us what religion we are. Government can't unreasonably search our house. Uh, without a warrant. Government can't station troops inside our, our properties. Um, those are our civil liberties. So what are civil rights then? Civil rights are not protections guaranteed in the Constitution. They are protections guaranteed by law. So civil rights are, are largely given by Congress, where the civil liberties are given by the Constitution. And these protections given by Congress are legal rights. There are laws. And who do they protect us from? If not the government, they protect us from our fellow citizens. right? And we're largely talking about discrimination and social order inequalities. So protections against discrimination for African-Americans, for Latinos, for gay and lesbian citizens, those are our civil rights. Um, civil liberties are, are in the same area, but different. So now we get to this really interesting question that when I post it on the screen, does the Bill of Rights apply to state governments? My guess is your knee jerk answer will be, yes, of course it does. But as you will see in this particular unit, which is most students' favorites, law is complicated and, and really interesting as you see how it builds on itself and how it works. And so I wanna take you through the history of this question. Does the Bill of Rights apply to state governments? Because if you look at the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, like the first, five words of the First Amendment quite literally are, Congress shall make no law. And it goes on to say Congress shall make no law restricting, you know, or establishing a religion uh, or limiting free exercise of it. But at, at its heart, Congress shall make no law. So if you read this literally, then Congress can't make a law, but it doesn't say anything about state governments. So the federal government is pretty clear, right? The federal government can't deprive you of your freedom of speech, your right to assemble, your freedom of expression, freedom of religion, or any of that. But what about Colorado? What about, you know, Utah? Could they? And so this question, obviously, as you're going to see, came in front of the courts in the 1830s. And rather than getting into the background of Barron v. Baltimore, I'll just say that the initial finding of the court, the opinion by the court at that time, the majority opinion, upheld that literal assessment that the federal government couldn't deprive civil liberties, but states could. And so when we think about 2020, 
obviously there's a gap there. How did we get from Baron v. Baltimore, where states were allowed to deprive of us of our civil liberties, to today where it's become less of a reality? And so the short answer to that is everything started changing um, after Baron v. Baltimore. When, when the court upheld that states could limit civil liberties and restrict the rights granted in the Bill of Rights, it took until the ratification of the 14th Amendment before these, these civil liberties, these, these given rights, we're starting to be applied to the states too. And so what is the 14th Amendment? The 14th Amendment was part of a package of amendments given post-Civil War that was largely dealing with extending rights out to people, particularly um, people that were former slaves and trying to kind of uh, expand civil liberties for everyone. And so the 14th Amendment and the 15th and the 16th, these are our Civil War amendments. And the 14th Amendment is the big one. It is a must know for the exam. I pretty much guarantee in a normal exam, it would have been on there. And I think it's still probably somewhat likely that even in our modified exam, you might see it. And so the 14th Amendment, plain and simple, is guaranteeing that all citizens of the United States have protected and guaranteed due process of law and equal protections under the law. Now, due process is a complicated thing. And I would I would encourage you to look it up right now um, just to kind of watch maybe a quick video on YouTube, a little two minute rendition. But essentially what due process is, is that the government can't take away any protections given to you or deny you protection of the law. Basically, they you have the right to protection from the law in all circumstances. And the other part is, is the, the equal protection. This is the second half of the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment does two things, guarantees due process and equal protection under the law. And if you think about equal protection under the law, basically what that means is you have to be protected no matter where you are in these United States of America. So if Ohio is able to take away some of your rights, right, but Colorado gives them, then do Colorado, do citizens of Colorado just by nature have more protection under like because they live in that state? No. What that means is that they they are protected equally everywhere. And so if you have the right to freedom of speech under the First Amendment at the federal level and Colorado says, yes, we agree, then. The 14th Amendment makes it pretty clear that just because you live in Ohio doesn't mean you get screwed and suddenly you don't have those laws. And so the path to applying the Bill of Rights to state governments too um, began with, with Gitlow v. New York. And Gitlow v. New York, it's, it's just a quick and interesting story. I think it is in your must-know cases. Um, you'll do a little bit more research for it. I actually think it might be tonight's homework, but essentially it came in 1919, right at the very end of the First World War. Um, and Gitlow had been advocating, he was a private US citizen who'd been advocating for the violent overthrow of the United States government. Right? And basically encouraging people to join his cause to rise up and, and basically take over or, or throw out the, the federal government. And he was thrown in jail for it. And he sued with the backing of, uh, I don't know if it was the ACLU at the time, but an interest group uh, helping him uh, advocate for his freedom of speech. And the court actually said, no, Gitlow, we upheld this limit on your freedom of speech. And that even though you have freedom of speech, your freedom of speech does not extend to advocating for the violent overthrow of the United States government. And so that's the, the simple rendition of what Gitlow dis decided, but the more detailed and nuanced opinion on there started to create this language and this pathway um, that started to apply through the due process clause of the 14th, 14th Amendment, the right to freedom of speech in all states. And so even though Gitlow's was, was denied in the decision, the, the opinion included significant language basically talking about the, the First Amendment protections as being applicable to the states as well. And so 
Gitlo started the incorporation doctrine, this, this ability to take um, civil liberties guaranteed in the Bill, Bill of Rights and through Supreme Court challenge, apply them to the states. Again, that's incorporation. I also think you should look this up.